Magic is an intrinsic part of many settings woven into the fabric of those universes, as much a reality as gravity. Natural forces that compose the world around us invariably have an effect on anything that lives, influencing evolution or sensible design for things created by artificial means. If the magic system is not something restricted to sapient life or created solely for a select few, it would only make sense if animals, plants, fungi, perhaps even protista or other primitive life forms evolved or were developed to benefit from it as much as possible. One of the most important aspects of world building is making sure everything is interconnected. A natural law like arcane forces often constitute a resource to tap into. If life finds a way to utilize such a source, it will exploit it to the fullest, with natural selection streamlining the best ways to do so. With all that said, this is a broad and complex question with many variables and an incomprehensible number of possible permutations. The nature of the magic system, habitat, time, lifestyle, external intervention, these all affect what is possible, advantageous and has longevity. Moreover, it is a pivotal question whether to even design a setting where non sapient beings are capable of casting spells, as there are plenty of consequences. My head is spinning from the sheer diversity of the topic, but I will try to stick to some semblance of structure and keep incoherent rambling to a minimum. As fun as it is just dragging my face across the keyboard following every fragmented idea, that wouldn't make a very good video, would it? So it is perhaps best if I begin by laying out some drawbacks for the whole concept, discuss ways to avoid it, then incrementally increase the amount of magic available to the biosphere and see where that leads us. I'll ease you into the really wacky stuff, leaving access to the equivalent of nuclear weaponry last and why that's not necessarily a great idea. Groundbreaking stuff, I know. Well then, I have dedicated a whole video to discuss animals and to a lesser extent other forms of life intertwined with the magic. Why do I feel the need to immediately try and dissuade people? Well, my goal is not to tell people what to do, but to offer advice. Therefore, it is best we take a look at what would be the consequences of crafting a magic system that is available to everyone and everything in the cosmos. These will be the things we need to account for even if we decide to go ahead with the idea, so it is by no means a useless exercise. Perhaps the simplest result of its inclusion is one that's not even an objective factor but a subjective feeling. If simple creatures are capable of using magic, if anything and everything can and does cast spells or consume arcane energies, that demystifies the concept. Magicians will no longer be a thing of their own as literally everyone and their dog would be able to use a country or two. The supernatural becomes common, mundane, some might even say cheap. To be fair, it is a completely valid approach to make magic something ordinary but would not necessarily work for every setting. If someone has the more classical image of fantasy in their head, with dedicated wizards and the old whimsical magical being, severely restricting access is kind of a necessity. But as I said, this is just a personal preference. So what about more tangible effects? Well, it all comes down to the sheer complexity and difficulty of management. Yes, management, not just the process of building. A host of pertinent questions are raised when we extend the availability of magic to beings of lower intelligence. How easy is it to cast spells? What are the requirements and prerequisites? And how did the creatures even begin to fulfill them? Can arcane forces be used by accident? By sheer instinct? What chance do non-magic user beings even stand in a competitive environment? What is the matter? What I mean by meta is the best pass for most circumstances. While variety and a diverse pool of arcane techniques might be entertaining for us, nature is a lot more cutthroat than to allow that. As natural selection works its way, animals would, by chance, happen upon the most efficient spells that do the required task best with as few resources expended as possible. Some designs, while stylish, might not make much sense in the context of evolution. Additionally, if instinct is enough to tap into arcane forces, if no complex thought or accurate ritual is required, can spells be cast unintentionally? How does that change the whole world? How does that change society? There must be safeguards if a callous fart can level a building. Moreover, if magic is used so fervently, if spells are cast left and right throughout the globe without pause, how does that affect the energy economy? 
Is magic finite? Is it renewable? Is it infinite? Constant casting absolutely has the potential of devastating the world, let alone the scenario where matter can be created out of thin air. Now, it is important to know that the vast majority of questions have possible answers, and magical animals or plants by no means destroy the realism of a setting by default. The potential dissuading factor is the sheer workload this introduces. An intricate web of interconnections needs to be constructed one we have relatively little reference for. Not only that, but it vastly increases the number of things one has to constantly keep in mind, all the extra possibilities and abilities that may affect the story but are not readily apparent. I'd say increasing access to magic makes everything exponentially more and more difficult to keep track of. There is a point where the challenge becomes nigh insurmountable, but with careful crafting and clever shortcuts it might just be manageable enough. On the flip side, there is a reason why the introduction of magic building animals can objectively improve a setting. This is highly dependent on the magic system in place, but in many cases even sapient species had to discover it, in case it wasn't crafted by an intelligent being, requires complex linguistics or deliberate thought, and is not dependent on specific circumstances too rare to rely on in nature, that discovery hinges on a simple accident. An accident that might happen regardless of cognitive capabilities. The ability to replicate said accident might drive certain creatures to better reproductive success, and voila, magical animals have become an inevitability. What this adds to the setting is a good dose of verisimilitude boosting consistency, cause and effect extended to all parties. That is not to say other approaches aren't valid or that this is objectively better, no. However, if done right, this is an indisputable improvement for applicable settings and might be the very reason one should consider it. Emphasis on applicable, not all worlds would benefit equally. Whether or not this brief preliminary exploration of potential difficulties and the one beneficial scenario nudged you in either direction, it is time to bring out the dial. A visual representation of how much magic we let animals and other non-sapient beings use. As you can see, it currently sits on zero. For people who might not wish to deal with all the consequential difficulties, those who would prefer to make their setting less magic oriented or keep spellcasters rare and prestigious, world builders who aim to create animals grounded in reality, some rules or other natural laws will have to be set. This is one of those world building questions where even exclusion warrants a bit of extra work. At least if you'd like to avoid the just don't think about it excuse. Uh, that quote is the bane of my existence. Anyway, how would one go about explaining the absence of magic for non-sapient creatures? Well, it all depends on the nature of the system in place, but some things are universally true. There needs to be a distinction, and a framework that allows that distinction to make a difference. Settings where magic is the product of intelligent design or has a mind of its own have the simplest solutions. The creator or creators of the arcade system could have decided to only allow access for a select few. Basing this on species or other immutable characteristics is a good way to set restrictions, whether it is only a few people who match desired traits or anyone belonging to the group arbitrarily set by designers or the system itself, this solution can be quite straightforward. It's not unlike what the world builder themselves does, after all. However, there is one catch, a rare occurrence at that, but still something to look out for. Depending on the criteria, outsiders, like aliens or entities coming from a different plane of existence, might very well not qualify. It is a question of consistency, really, and avoiding the problem it might cause is easy. Simply keep in mind what enables magicians to cast spells before granting access to beings who aren't native of whose existence the creators or arcane forces could not have known about. But adding an arbiter or arbiters who police magic use, or making magic a thinking being are far from the only solutions. There are a number of significant differences between something that's sapient and something that isn't. A rather obvious one is intelligence. If magic works in a way that requires concentration and deliberate thought, if mere instinct alone does not cut it, that sets a soft barrier for most creatures. 
while many animals are quite intelligent, instinct does a lot of the heavy lifting for them, especially when it comes to using their own bodies and abilities. As such, if you need to know precisely what you are doing, and that something is at least somewhat complex, it is unlikely that accidental mutations and behavioral changes would lead to the development of spellcasting in animals. Plants and fungi are unlikely to even qualify, and more primitive beings are just off the table entirely. The more intricate these requirements are, the less likely even the cleverest of beasts would be able to figure out magic. However, there is a very delicate and interesting balance to account for here. Assuming that the methodology of sorcery isn't shared with people by entities that know of its existence, it would, like most things in life, be happened upon by chance. This event would most likely lead to a gradual, exploratory phase. Magic users, having acquired knowledge of something they can do, would likely experiment with what else there is and develop their skills, which is all fine and good an organic process. However, if it can be happened upon by chance, it might be simple enough for animals to replicate the circumstances unintentionally. Depending on how old the world is, there might have been ample time for such accidents to happen and for creatures to evolve to be able to instinctively repeat them. Yes, this is the scenario where the arcane and survival of the fittest converge, creating a wonderfully intriguing but not necessarily desired circumstance. You might be thinking that the solution to this is very simple, as increasing the complexity of using magic would solve the issue. Well, yes, but it might lead to another one. It might become too intricate to realistically expect people finding out on their own. After all, for a discovery to be made, at least one spell needs to be simple enough to cast accidentally. People have a tendency to believe in the supernatural, trying to find ways to summon otherworldly powers, even when the mysticism they so fervently embrace is just a figment of their imagination. Perhaps it is an unavoidable result of sapience and free will. Perhaps it is an inherently human trait. Whichever the case, the fact that some people think in such a way gives credence to the idea that even somewhat complex magical systems can be found naturally. But it is easy to go overboard. Arcane forces that can only be conjured by specific languages, rituals, during cosmic events, with very specific, unnatural motion, by written word or geometric shapes arranged the cascading pattern, are unlikely to be just happened upon. However, such restrictions also eliminate non-sapient beings from the list of potential magic users. Therefore, it is still a solution, but requires the information to be passed on to people rather than letting them figure it out on their own. Alternatively, one may somewhat mix the previous two main solutions, something that does not need intelligent design, thinking magic or difficult casting. Maybe the magic system is a natural part of the world, it's there to be used, but is not so simple to tap into. It might require some special chemical, a unique organ, maybe a genetic fragment or any other biological feature that just so happens to have evolved or appeared in sapient beings. Maybe it's not even a guarantee and requires a rare trait. However, this needs to be somewhat of a coincidence to keep animals from also evolving the conduit that grants access to the arcane. Something closely tied to sapiens that serves a different purpose, but coincidentally allows casting spells as well. An unexpected benefit that stuck around until someone figured out that they can do far more than their mortal body would suggest. This solution may be extended to a material too. Specific objects that are capable of channeling magic, substances that can be used to craft wands, staves, potions, or what have you. This is a great way to not only limit the type of beings capable of using magic, but also introduces restrictions on those who potentially could. Restrictions that can be explored and developed into something interesting, presenting numerous narrative opportunities. That being said, this is not a foolproof method. There may be a few animals capable of using tools, or plants that dissolve and utilize these sources. These could learn or evolve to cast simple spells and seek these materials. However, I think this is more of a benefit than a drawback. Adding a couple of these creatures, however rare, would definitely deepen the connection between the systems in one's world, providing a satisfying facet for the audience to explore or witness. 
They could also double as natural hazards for those seeking to acquire the necessary raw materials. Two magically amplified tailor birds with one stone of cosmic power. But this is not all. There is one more option linked to that, which is a bit more… drastic. Despite that, I do think it offers writing opportunities just as interesting as the previous one. What if the magical material is not exactly the thing that enables magic, but the change it induces in the person, a change that ultimately has a negative effect on their health, and the trade-off of arcane potency? Then one has to make significant sacrifices to acquire unique powers, it opens the way to some interesting dilemmas. To stay on topic though, animals and plants would likely avoid it or develop resistance to its corrupting effects. Spells are all well and good, but not when they come at the cost of reproductive success and survival, at least not from an evolutionary standpoint. Producing strong, fertile offspring is paramount, after all. Alternatively, the cost may come directly from casting any spells. Taking a toll on the caster would be more than enough for the vast majority of life to never bother developing ways to utilize magic. Evolving complex mechanisms that cause you harm and provide limited benefit is not a great strategy, given that magic is not too easy to use and cannot do incredible shit that is. If one can regenerate any wound at the cost of sneezing a few times, it's well worth it. So think about the balance as all options have ways to screw them up. The ability to transfer the cost to someone or something else can mess with the system, for instance. Depending on how difficult it is and what abilities are granted, some animals might very well evolve to catch sacrificial lambs and use them as magic batteries. Which is not necessarily a bad thing, of course, but we are discussing ways to avoid non-sapient spellcasters right now. And now we aren't. What an epic segue. If I didn't chase you off with that one, it is time to slowly introduce more and more magic use to animals, plants and other living things and see how they might fare. Where better to start than perhaps some of the most common ways this concept is used. Magic as a source of energy. As you probably already know, every ecosystem is based on primary producers. Things that can utilize and transform non-organic forms of energy. Creatures that feed on them indirectly live off of the same energy that was harvested by these entities, which are most often plants. Photosynthesis, chemosynthesis, radiosynthesis… There are multiple sources and strategies to absorb them. If the source is constant enough, life can develop around it. It would be naive to think that magic cannot be such an energy source, as wizards themselves need to tap into it to cause their sorcery. Unless there is some artificial or natural restriction keeping magic reserved to specific entities, some simple unicellular species would eventually evolve ways to use the arcane energies for their bodily processes. Given enough time, they would later develop into something like plants, streamlining the best ways to consume cosmic forces. A pretty neat concept and a really easy solution for things like subterranean life. Yes, it is one of the biggest things missing from my first ever world building video. Let's just say there was room for improvement when I made that. There still is, but holy hell, covering such a topic in 10 minutes? Regardless, a magic based food chain could exist anywhere really, even amid regular plant life and would not necessarily be too different from any other ecosystem above the primary producer level. Since the arcane energies would be stored in plain old carbohydrates of some kind, higher levels do not necessarily need special adaptations to consume and utilize them. Unless the plant equivalents also benefit from some imbument, a spell-based defense mechanism, any herbivore would likely be able to munch on them for sustenance. Designing such a food web is quite an interesting task as it has relatively few inherent restrictions. However, there is one thing to look out for. Viability. As I've said, they can appear anywhere, so even if the primary producers have a low efficiency and the system in general doesn't have much energy to go around, they would still be viable in some places. On the other hand, making them too good can have unwanted consequences. They would compete for space with regular biomes sustained by photosynthesis. Unless there is some limitation or where magic appears in a harvestable form or plants have some way to combat their spread, they would overtake the planet. So unless that is the kind of world you are going for, it is best to balance the primary producers accordingly. This would be our lowest level of magic accessibility, simple sustenance. Let's stir the diet just a tiny bit more. 
What if non-sapient creatures could, as a result of evolution or purposeful design, cast a very low level, highly simple, relatively weak spells? Think a small push of invisible force, a tiny spark, or a barely visible jolt of electricity. How would this change natural life? From an evolutionary standpoint, depending on how easy it is to develop magic use, it has a good shot at appearing in nearly every creature, most likely in subtle ways for the most part. I imagine animals and other beings augmenting things they already do with a bit of magic, empowering their strikes, speeding up their escape, giving their jumps extra height, making their flight more elegant, increasing their resource gathering capabilities, perhaps attracting mates with a dazzling display of cheap tricks. It is easy to see how beneficial this would be for almost anything, with rather small changes overall to any given entity. Everything would function at a slightly higher level, with animals, plants, fungi and any other form of life incapable of tapping into sorcery, swiftly outcompeted by those who can. The easiest way to imagine this is taking any earth animal, looking at their capabilities and just augmenting them ever so slightly. Maybe add the weak little magic ability to spice things up, like a zap that surprises any would-be attacker for long enough to make a hasty retreat. Unless there is mutual exclusivity, it is unlikely that animals would develop magic instead of other, more reliable and potentially stronger abilities. I doubt that a bombardier beetle's chemical spray or an electric eel's painful bolt would cease to exist just because there is a weaker arcane alternative. Amplification or backup methods are far more likely. My one advice would be to never underestimate what even the simplest forms of magic can bring to the table. It is often the flashy spells like firestorms or conjuration that enjoy the most attention. However, even telekinesis can be used to great effect. Just imagine the sheer amount of possibilities accelerating or decelerating an object by a small margin can yield, snatching an unreachable fruit, facilitating flight, slowing down the opponent to score a lethal hit. We could even discuss mind alteration, but I think that would be a higher level simply for the impact it can have on any interaction, even if just a small suggestion. So, depending on who gets access and what they use it for, there could definitely be a shift favoring magic using animals. But at this point, general design is not necessarily affected, only skill and power. Naturally, there could be creatures that lean into these powers, hoarding as many options as they can, but they might not necessarily be the most efficient form of life, especially if magic is not very dependable. Which brings me to a point that is relevant for many of the magic levels we are going to discuss. Reliability is rather important in nature. Being capable of doing something impressive some of the time is not as good as being able to do something adequate all of the time. When these failures can mean the difference between life and death, evolution and natural selection in general tends to err on the side of caution. Not exactly a groundbreaking statement, but it is true nonetheless. Basically, if a D is enough to pass, some creatures that can reliably produce that result will generally be favored over the one that has a mix of A's and F's, even if the overall average of the latter is higher. They failed more times, so it likely means they had fewer opportunities to reproduce and pass on their genes, even if every other time they excelled beyond what was necessary. Naturally, this is not a universal law. There can always be exceptions, but dependability is very important. Best avoid gambling if you can. This letter is a universal law though. Don't spend your life savings on CSGO lot or crypto. Moving on, it is time we turn the dial just a little more, adding a bit more power to spells. You can imagine this level as kind of the basic spells seen in most settings. Think bolts of random elements, minor buffs, stuns with a short duration, stuff like that. This is where we do enter a bit of a conundrum. Most of these spells are rather effective at killing. Regardless of how much damage it does in game, a sharpened icicle will pierce the flesh of many creatures with ease. If these sorts of spells are common, and why would they not, they are very useful, then they can have a devastating effect on a single ecosystem. There is sort of a safety measure, or more of a self-defeating cycle that comes into effect when something becomes too good at, well, consumption. 
The vast majority of life is sustained by renewable resources. However, these resources have a refresh rate and are not unlimited. When something becomes very successful, their numbers increase as they have an easier time surviving and siring offspring. This in turn means a growing rate of consumption and a higher pressure on the resources they consume, be those other living beings or organic material. There is always a breaking point, a population number so high they can no longer obtain enough of the dwindling resources. As a result, their population comes crashing down. They go well below what would be the sustainable level in the environment, as there is already a shortage. But as time moves on and the resources have the chance to replenish, the creatures can regain some of their former numbers. In nature, this process repeats a couple of times with smaller and smaller deviations from the coveted equilibrium. More consumers, less resources, then less consumers and more resources. After a while, the population number somewhat stabilizes, minimizing fluctuation. This is all well and good, but not the only possible outcome. Under some circumstances, the resources, for example a prey animal, can be fully depleted beyond recovery, which can lead to the extinction of the consumer as well. I'd say the sudden ability to incinerate would likely be such a scenario. Even at this level, the world builder has to account for many chaotic possibilities. Offensive spells can be devastating, defensive spells can starve out consumers, utility magic can do either or both. That is not to say one cannot create a somewhat stable, self-sustaining ecosystem with decently powerful magic involved. There are a number of checks and balances we can use. The most universal and simple ones involve a balance of offense and defense. Increasing how effective something is at killing, or just simple resource gathering, can be offset with similarly powerful tools on the other side of the equation. Say something like a manticore evolves to conjure spikes it can launch to great distances, thus killing faraway prey. However, the prey learns to deflect the spikes with a spell of its own. If it is attentive enough, it can protect itself, but manticores are still able to surprise quite a few of them. This is a very rudimentary example. You can introduce a lot more nuance to an elaborate system. Even mundane methods can be used to counteract magical abilities, but evolution can hardly do anything here in many cases. If casting spells does not require biological conduits, significantly different instinctual behavior, or any other tangibly limiting factor, switching off what sorcerer a creature uses may happen incomparably faster than evolution. Well, even with changes in instinct, in the case of etymological adaptations, there tends to be a smaller time frame involved. This is one of the difficulties that comes with removing certain limits. A constant, rapid change in the environment, which may never find a matter, so to speak, with any kind of longevity. Naturally, one may embrace this tumultuous world and work with it, or simply introduce some restrictions. Making requirements for certain or all spells more difficult to fulfill can eliminate the constant switching of magical abilities. Designating certain regions that grant arcane powers to creatures can relegate these chaotic habitats to a few locations. There's also the option to forcibly limit what beings can even tap into sorcery and control their population through other inefficiencies so they do not kill or eat everything and die out as a result. Alternatively, make certain circumstances be prerequisites for using magic. The very Various animals, plants, fungi and everything else may have the ability to do something rather powerful, but only very rarely. Rarely enough to not completely imbalance the ecosystem, but still be a deciding factor for survival as well as a potential story element. Then there is the option of resistance. Now, I generally do not support the way magic resistance is implemented, especially if elemental magic is involved. Why cannot fire be blocked by a shield as effectively as an arrow? How does a bolt of arcane energy penetrate metal armor as if it was nothing, but not go straight through anything behind that very sturdy material? I'd say physical means should be just as effective at blocking magic as this intangible thing we call resistance. It is a useful mechanic regardless and can provide innate protection from potentially devastating forces. Whether it works by making spells more difficult to cast or dampens their effectiveness, it can serve as a way to balance creatures with supernatural powers. Evolved by chance or given up on creation, this would likely be something innately present in most, if not all, forms of life. 
given time. Well, all forms of life that interact with other forms of life that can double in wizardry. It may even be a natural side effect of magic use, slowly building up a resistance in everything in its vicinity, circumventing the need for random chance in the case of evolution. It is important to keep in mind that all of these countermeasures and balancing factors are useful and often even necessary for higher levels of magic too. I will not repeat everything ad infinitum, so let's focus on what changes. Turn and dial just a smidge more towards rather significant spells. I'm talking fireballs, force fields, long term augmentation, and a couple extra will detail in a bit. While, as I said, these can still be balanced using the aforementioned methods, there is a bit of an extra factor. You can make various forms of life less susceptible to magic, but there is relatively little you can do about the environment without touching the nature of matter. Sure, the magically infused ferret may withstand an explosion, but the surrounding earth, rock and even air just burn up and get displaced. Fledgling civilizations would have quite the trouble getting off the ground if their dirt hovels can be vaporized by a passing pigeon. There's no reason one cannot work with or around this, of course, it is simply something to keep in mind. We often tend to forget about the durability of objects and the permanence of damage when powerful spells are thrown around. Such a world would be scarred by a billion battles over the epochs, with sapient life alone standing a chance to craft something more resilient by ingenuity or magic. But let's talk about something that is far more difficult to work around. Certain classes of spells that are very powerful, and by their nature, can completely annihilate our concept of an ecosystem. One of these classes is summoning. Without involving the details of duration and the creature summoned, this is an extremely useful ability in a vast number of cases. If the summoner has control over the summonee, or at least has some safeguards against getting hurt, it changes everything. Resource gathering, hunting, protection, mate finding, asserting dominance, hell, even if the summon thing is just a quick snack, it is an incredible tool to have. Something that can summon outclasses all of its peers that cannot, with the aforementioned details only determining by how much. I cannot emphasize enough how imbalanced this can make ecosystems. Ubiquitous access to summoning magic would make spellcasting the axis around which the world revolves. All stages of life, beyond those physically incapable of conjuration, like bacteria, would be dominated by this ability. Anything that cannot call forth an ally from thin air would be outcompeted by those who can. Which is not to say that such a world cannot theoretically exist, but my head is spinning just from trying to imagine what it would look like. I believe summoning, if not available to almost everything in existence, can only work under severe limitations. I suggest relegating it to sapient life in the first place, but if you think it should be extended to other beings, it needs a high cost or a barrier to entry. A lack of adequate control would limit summoning to scenarios where the caster is not relying on the summoned entity to do something specific or something outside its natural behavior. Linking summoning to very specific adaptations or designs, perhaps locations, can also serve you well. The goal is to make summoning beings not objectively better than everything else us or if they are, restricting them geographically. There needs to be some reason why conjuration is not the jackpot of evolution or creature design from a viability perspective, why these beings cannot dominate the globe. The second class of spells suffers from a very similar issue, it is too good. I'm talking about influencing one's mind, especially if control is possible. In the real world, the best we can do is try to suggest behaviors, like attempting to scare away someone unwanted or luring a potential prey close enough to strike. These suggestions become more difficult if the target's perception of the world differs from ours and will not work in many of the scenarios where it would be most useful. Stomp your foot at the ground all you want, that charging rhino will not have a change of heart. This all changes when we introduce a supernatural way to steer or even command other beings. It is already a contentious topic for sapient spell users for a variety of reasons, but it becomes all the more complicated when it comes to less intelligent life, unburdened by morality, especially if something more primitive has the capacity to infiltrate the mind of something complex. Some of you may object to my assessment by claiming that this feminine already exists, and you may cite cordyceps. 
Well, to that I would say, while struggling to suppress my aneurysm, that is not how it works in real life. Fungi and other parasites, like Toxoplasma, coincidentally evolved a way to make strong automatic suggestions to the host. They do not think, they do not even have a concept of what they are doing to the creature they infect, they simply do. It is something that accidentally developed for them and since it has a tangible benefit, it stuck around and got fine-tuned over time. There is no entity that is capable of getting into the mind of something and piloting it like a vehicle, except maybe if we count elaborate brainwashing techniques, but that is still an external party interacting with brain chemistry and the victim's psyche to enforce a specific outcome. So no, the cordyceps is just a plain old fungus, not an alien hive mind. I've talked about how terrible this piece of world building in The Last of Us is, so I'm not going to go over that again. I don't want another one of my brain arteries to burst. Anyway, something becoming more effective at enforcing its will at the outside world is not to be underestimated. It is not just a cool little ability, like summoning, it is an absolute game changer. Without limitation, it overtakes the world, with the end result probably looking like a hive mind of a single superorganism, which is an excellent concept, presenting very unique, very alien opportunities for storytelling and world building. However, that is only one specific world and not the thing most would go for. The point is, this is an ability that would dominate, literally. These creatures would rapidly outcompete other beings, with even stronger capabilities winning over each other if the capacity to improve exists. Imagine a predator stunning its prey, or just distracting it for a second. Picture a herbivore making its attacker just stop breathing for a couple of minutes. What about a tiny worm hijacking the body of a dragon, bringing it to a hive to become the new nursery for baby worms? Taking free will away from something is what one could call overpowered. Mind control too requires some limitations to keep the world, well, intact. Similar restrictions can do fine, with the added benefit that resistance is far more straightforward and effective here. The only catch is, if everything has resistance, nothing has mind control capabilities, and if something doesn't have resistance, it doesn't stand much chance, so it's more of an all or nothing situation. Before we turn the dial again, there is one more type of spell to account for, healing. Whether it is rapid regeneration, an undo button for injuries, or something as drastic as resurrection, I don't think I need to point out how powerful this can be. Natural selection is based on reproductive success. If something is much harder to kill, it will have more reproductive success. Therefore, in a world where a huge part of life revolves around killing others, be they animals, plants, fungi or whatever, those that are significantly more resilient will be the ones that stand the test of time. If magical healing does not require specific adaptations or resources, it's just a glorified get out of the grave free card. At the most extreme end of it, optimal life would be just to sit around, eat parts of yourself and let it grow back. Naturally, this means conjuring matter from nothing, as one cannot get the same amount of resources from eating an arm as it would a growing one. Still, detaching limbs in order to escape death is an already existing strategy for some animals, like the common wall lizard. This is a significant resource investment for them though, and they will not have the option to use this ability for quite some time once they pull the trigger. The strategy would likely be much more widely adopted in a world where creatures have the access to magical healing. But taking a quick U-turn, let's look at the nature of healing too. Conjuring matter from nothing, while not a great choice, is one way to do it. Unfortunately though, this would mess with a lot of the fundamentals of the world, theoretically removing all scarcity while presenting a world-ending danger in the overproduction of various matters. But that is a whole other topic, so I will not discuss that in detail right now. I just mentioned that I do not recommend it. Alternatively, the spell could simply use existing matter, including flesh. This could potentially introduce a very nice limitation on healing. You may survive a grave wound, reset a fractured bone to be able to flee, or triumph over a deadly illness, but you expend a lot of your own resources in the process. Something that helps you in the short term, giving you a fighting chance, but at the cost of being worse off than before the injury. 
hunger, nausea, tiredness, wicked thirst, probably a good deal of pain too. Creatures would still use it in many situations, but carelessly healing may even kill the caster under some circumstances. So, what could be the effects of healing on a global biosphere or a local ecosystem in broad strokes? Well, I think there are three main outcomes. On the extreme side, it could make everything unkillable. If everything is unkillable, heterotrophic organisms would have a hard time. This could lead to the self-feeding ouroboros of a world I mentioned a little while back. Predators and herbivores can take a bite, but the victim just regrows everything. Changes would be fewer and farther between in terms of evolution as resource scarcity is solved. Meeting success is the only thing that matters. It would be a slanashi utopia, excess in everything and your one job is to copulate. But this is another one of the high concepts that few people are going for. As fun and weird as the dogscape is, it does limit narrative possibilities. So there is the option to still have healing but limit its capabilities. Things are tougher, regenerative, capable of fighting back even from death's door. Well, that means one thing really. Things that consume these hard beings need to be a lot more vicious, a lot stronger, fine-tuned to finish a fight as soon as it begins. This is a good justification to have super predators, creatures that are so common and prevalent in speculative fiction. Extremely lethal weapons, excellent reflexes and speed, strength beyond what would be necessary for an earth animal. Size is still debatable, see my massive creatures video for a bit more info on that. Either way, this might just be what a world builder is looking for, even if this solution wasn't the one they had in mind. Alternatively, there is the third option, which is one of the possible explanations for perhaps the most common tropes. High durability. Well, not exactly high, just higher than what we are used to. Being able to withstand more punches, stabs, gunshots, all manner of injuries, and heal back to full health given the time. Basically, Hollywood action scenes, but actually justified. The infamous shoulder wound that never seems to have any form of permanence would not be a minor plot hole, just part of how the world operates. Now that we have discussed the spell types that have the most unique effects, well, we did not touch on teleportation, did we? That's another juicy one. An animal that can teleport is almost impossible to kill without an ambush or other countermeasures. A plant that teleports probably kills itself. Teleportation is a doozy on its own and granting it to no sapient beasts just further complicates things. How can you even prevent a displacer beast from appearing in your living room, grabbing your newborn for a snack, then teleporting out? Sure, you could think about strategies and counter spells, but what about other animals? I feel like a teleporting predator would run into a problem where nothing has a chance against them. Not even teleporting prey, as being able to rapidly displace yourself is directly countered by an ambush. They have the potential of breaking any ecosystem to the point where they run into the problem of consuming everything, then dying off. Unless limiting teleportation to the point of borderline non-viability, I'd only give it to prey animals at most. Even then, they need to be balanced some other way, as they overtake all habitats for having such an excellent defense mechanism. That is a workable problem though. Not so much for predators. Is my plan to never include any carnivore that can teleport ever in anything under all circumstances? Well, no. I even have a relatively easy solution to have your cake and eat it too. But before I talk about it, let's turn the dial just one more time. We are in cataclysmic territory now. Erupting volcanoes, terrible storms, spells that flash freeze huge areas. What we are witnessing at this level is madness. It is power nobody should have access to, and yet here we are. Simple-minded creatures capable of causing more destruction than even modern humans. Naturally, a planet with multiple of these species cannot persist. Even if they cannot kill each other, they can certainly make the globe uninhabitable. This is a level where a single one of these beings is enough to be a world-ending scenario. We are not talking about responsible people trying to limit destruction to a minimum. These are mostly instinct-driven entities that need only to feel threatened or be amused by what they do. Without the ability to comprehend the weight of their actions, there is no telling what can happen. 
including any number of such mighty forms of life, is a precarious situation, for its inhabitants at any rate. I'd say either use them extremely sparingly, or when you want to see your world burn. Due to their destructive nature, they would either be the result of intelligent design, or some rare magical anomaly or unlikely mutation. Making them a logical step in natural development isn't the best idea in most scenarios, as they also kind of mark the end of natural development. There would be few generations to see the light of day once they are prancing around, flinging mustard gas tornadoes. Unless... Well, there is no point in teasing you anymore. There's a way to include any wacky, magic-wielding, impossible being and still have it make sense. How? Well, let's turn that dial beyond its breaking point. Oh yes, what I'm talking about is an entirely different plane of existence. One that forgoes the laws of our own universe and revolves around magic and space-time fuckery. Where left could be right, life could be death and water could be wet. Naturally, good world building would involve setting out these weird rules and consistently applying them to the world, especially if it is the main setting of your stories. One can go surreal and difficult to grasp, but narrative satisfaction comes from the simple concept of cause and effect and the audience's ability to follow them. I'd rather not go into any detail here, as there is little point, the best I could do is random ideas and pointless statements, so instead I'll focus on the far more common example of this plane simply being part of a larger setting. In this case, some outlines for the wacky nature of the world can be enough, even if these rules are never shared with the audience. Some pattern to the madness can help you avoid certain events or plot points appearing contrived and have the reader, viewer or listener follow along. However, what absolutely does need some set laws is how these otherworldly beings appear in the main setting. Summoning or naturally opening gateways are the most probable ways but that still begs the question. With such a stark contrast in what is possible there and here, how can they even make the crossing? Does the universe automatically make them bend to its own laws of physics, shaping their body into something flesh and bone, or at least on the periodic table? Do they require a vessel of this world? Something they can pilot and use to interact with the environment? Or perhaps it is the conjurer themselves that shapes them into something possible? Additionally, how can they use their whimsical abilities in this world? Is magic shared between the two planes? Do they get a different skill set due to their addict nature? Is it reality they shape instead of sorcery? Whichever the case, this is an excellent solution to have a somewhat grounded world, but still introduce really outlandish things, beings that should not exist, or possess abilities that could end the world were they given to plants or animals. With these methods, you have direct control over how many of them can exist in the main setting and when. While still having a non-sapient being with incredible abilities, their presence hinges on actual sapient beings doing the summoning, or if you go the naturally opening gateways route, you can make it rare enough to not pose a serious threat, but still present interesting story potential. And that's where I'd call this topic discussed. I hope at least some of it was informative or useful. It is quite a journey scripting these videos, and while I do redraft them once I'm finished, random ideas do often take the saddle and I'm just along for the ride. Regardless, if you found the ramblings to be at least tolerable and would like to have a chat or support the channel, there are Discord and Patreon links in the description. Next video will probably be another monster dissection, and I'll soon have a voting ready for the world building episode after that one. Hope to see you then as well, have a pleasant time on this wonderful and terrible planet in the meantime, bye!